Welcome to ACOG's Video History Project. Today, we are extremely fortunate that we have as our interviewee Dr. Dorothy Shaw, past president of FIGO, member of ACOG, and one of the world's leading advocates for women's rights. Dorothy, we're extremely happy to have you here today. Thank you, Ralph. It's a great honor. Let's begin so that people understand who you are. Let's go back to your very early beginning. Where were you born? Where were you raised? What part of Canada? Well, I wasn't born and raised in Canada. I was born and raised in the UK. And, uh, and at that time, um, it was, I, I think I was really quite socially sheltered, both as a child and even as an adolescent. Went to university in Edinburgh in Scotland and um, and always had a really strong sense of social justice from a very early age and that sort of manifests itself during teenage years. Um, but I never really thought of myself consciously as an advocate or a political type person until quite a bit later in life. Um, and uh, it was during my uh, years as a medical student in Edinburgh where I began to see things that um, probably didn't register uh, at the time in a way that they have registered since then. So, um, for example, I, uh, as a medical student between our preclinical and clinical years, my very first clinical experience was in Montreal. I traveled as a medical student to Montreal. and. Uh, I was green in every way that you could possibly imagine. And um, I remember my first uh, delivery um, was a little traumatic uh, because uh, I think the, the consultant that was um, supervising me perhaps didn't realize it was my very first delivery and uh, uh, expected me to be able to do things, which I clearly couldn't. Um, and. Uh, so I remember that um, as being less than ideal. And then my first gynecological experience was with the chief resident at the time who took me to see a woman in emergency, a young woman, um, must have been in her early 20s. And this would have been in 1969. So it was right after uh, abortion and contraception were legalized in Canada. And uh, this woman, this was my very first view uh, inside a woman's body, if you like, um, and uh, doing a speculum exam in emergency, this woman had a huge hole in her upper vagina from potassium permanganate because she tried to induce an abortion. Um, and at that time, even though uh, the law had changed, it was far from accessible or even known to the public. And then, um, it kind of built from there and when I was back in Edinburgh doing more clinical work, uh, I recall that as with a consultant in obstetrics and gynecology and the, seeing another woman uh, and um, she was also uh, very uh, concerned about the fact that she had an unplanned, unwanted pregnancy and, um, and the consultant had to refer her for a psychiatric opinion at that time so that she could actually uh, have an abortion. And, and I remember sitting there thinking, this is, this is really uh, not right. Uh, this woman is not uh, in need of psychiatric care and there's something wrong here that she can't uh, more easily access the care that she needs. At that time, as I said, I was, uh, it was really sort of building somewhere in my conscious, consciousness, but uh, this would have been very early in the 1970s in Edinburgh, and it was a very uh, hierarchical, patriarchal system, and certainly speaking up or speaking out would not have been something that, uh, that would have occurred to me at the time. But clearly, it, it wasn't something that I was about to forget. Then why did you decide to go into OBGYN? <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, 
because of the experiences that I had, I knew that, uh, that I very much wanted to do either pediatrics or OBGYN. And uh, I did my, what was then an internship, um, six months surgery and six months medicine in um, pediatrically focused uh, areas. It was all pediatrics. And realized quite early on through that internship that although uh, it was, um, I've always enjoyed medicine, I, I, every aspect of medicine, but I knew that this wasn't the right place for me. And, um, and I knew, based on previous experience, that some kind of bridging between obstetrics and pediatrics was probably where I was going to find my home. And so, uh, in order to do more obstetrics training, uh, it turned out that um, Vancouver, where Molly Towell was um, the grandmother, if you like, of perinatology at the time, it was not even totally recognized as a subspecialty, was there and, uh, and um, I applied to come and do a residency in Vancouver for a year because that time it was possible. And, uh, and so came for a year uh, to Vancouver with no intention of emigrating, um, enjoyed the obstetrics very, very much. I knew that I'd found my home and, uh, and then went back to the UK to do more obstetrics. Um, and didn't settle down. As a woman in our specialty at that point in time in the UK, uh, there were two things really that uh, were very clear to me. One was that uh, I wanted women to understand what was happening to them and that they needed more knowledge about their bodies, about the changes that happen during pregnancy and delivery and, uh, and from a reproductive point of view in general and from their health point of view. And that clearly wasn't how the system was working, and yet I'd seen a different um, potential when I was uh, here. And I actually was in San Francisco as a medical student, too, which is where we are now. Um, so I'd seen how things were able to be different uh, in a different system. And, um, and as well, I knew that, uh, that because I, um, I'm not known for being quiet, uh, I'm fairly independent-minded, uh, that waiting for the pyramidal system and um, really following uh, along, so to speak, until uh, I was able to be a consultant wasn't really going to work for me. Um, I needed to be able to uh, be freer to pursue the things that I thought were important for women. It was interesting that you mis mentioned potassium permanganate. I think if you surveyed every OBGYN in this, there would be less than 5% that had ever seen a case. It's very, I have, <laughs> as you know, it's very, how shall I say, very dramatic to see what yes. women will go through, go through something like this. It really is. It's, uh, and in my, I mean, in my own clinical work, that's the only time that I've seen, uh, because things change so quickly, both in the UK and in Canada, uh, it's the only time I've seen that uh, in my own personal work. But at the same time, um, in my travels around the world, um, I, I've certainly seen women who uh, were dying in public general hospitals because of not usually potassium permanganate but certainly other uh, means that they had used in desperation to address uh, their own personal life situation of this unwanted pregnancy and I think you know it's interesting um, I I have to admit that at some stage and when I was a resident early on in my career I was uh, even though I was very pro-choice even then and very supportive of women's right to access abortion, um, I, I also uh, was sometimes a little, uh, what's the right word, I, I wasn't always uh, fully supportive of everyone's decision, uh, if you will, when I could see that there was a couple that was engaged and they were in university, for example. I remember that very clearly because I learned from it. Um, I did actually try and 
persuade them, if you will, to continue the pregnancy because they said, well, it's not the right time for us. And, um, and I knew that there was never a right time uh, for a pregnancy. Um, and at the same time, you know, if people loved each other and clearly they were planning children later, that maybe they wanted to rethink that. And it wasn't, it wasn't appropriate for me uh, to really um, to take that uh, approach and um, I never did it again. During this period of time, obviously you had a number of mentors that influenced you. Who would you say were the most important? Oh gosh, that's, that's a really good question. I have been blessed by many mentors along the way. Um, and uh, I think that um, women and men uh, and so I think it depends which area that we're thinking about. Uh, so I think that probably in terms of um, women's rights and uh, global women's reproductive health, it would have to be Mahmoud Fatala. Uh, I was so fortunate, um, this was back in 1990, uh, Mahmoud who, uh, no, sorry, 19, 1999. Mahmoud had uh, approached me to ask if I would co-chair a study group with him on women's sexual reproductive rights as a result of the WHO FIGO Alliance who'd made the decision that this was the, the way forward. And uh, at that point, uh, with his stature and um, and my interest, uh, it was uh, both a gift, uh, an honor, and an amazing privilege. It was uh, a very special time. And um, although he would never admit to me that this was intentional, for the very first meeting of this study group, uh, Mahmoud um, didn't arrive until lunchtime. Um, uh, of the day, which left me chairing the meeting um, until he arrived in the morning. I still remember those two days of that first meeting of the study group quite vividly. Uh, the people around the table were, um, for, we had Rebecca Cook uh, from Lawyer Annabelle Faundes, um, Marianne Hasselgrave from uh, uh, the Commonwealth Medical Association. I mean, there, there were people around the table from with such tremendous diverse experience uh, about women's sexual reproductive rights, the current status, <clears throat> particularly in the developing world, but not only. And, um, and some ideas on how we could, as a profession, uh, show leadership in um, moving forward the lives of women and uh, how uh, through what could be done uh, their health would improve and their lives would improve. It, it was just an amazing opportunity. And then, of course, that became a committee. I was the inaugural chair. Mahmoud was there uh, throughout the first three years uh, on that committee. And um, for those who've never uh, been in a meeting with Mahmoud, his, his presence is um, is really quite instrumental to progress and he's very quiet uh, which is a great buffer to me because I'm I'm very uh, lively and uh, and at the end of discussion sometimes even at the end of the day he would listen all day and then he'd be able to synthesize what had been discussed into a very few sentences and uh, it would capture everything that had been said in a very meaningful way and with some action items that we could take forward. It's, it's a very rare gift to witness and it was a privilege to actually benefit from. He is a very remarkable gentleman. I have him very high on my uh, relationship too. But I think he also recognized your excellence in this. Let me take you back. I'd like to talk a little bit about your career. Mm -hmm. Once you got to Vancouver, you began to move through the academic type career. Mm -hmm. What type of problems did you run into? Oh, you really know how to ask the questions, don't you? 
<laughs> I don't tell this story very often. Um, well, that was a time when, uh, as residents, um, one was not, uh, well, okay, I'll, I'll leave that part. I mean, I wasn't married and I wasn't pregnant, but just to say that, uh, that getting pregnant during residency at that time was frowned upon, uh, to put it mildly. Um, in our resident call room, uh, there were uh, pictures on the wall that would have been suitable for an auto mechanics garage. Uh, and, um, uh, and because I had come from the UK, I was very polite, uh, even though I'm um, sometimes outspoken. It took me a while to really adjust to this system. Um, I had some amazing uh, mentors during residency in terms of gynecological surgery. Um, I remember two of them quite, quite clearly, but many, many mentors. And, uh, and then once I finished my residency um, and realized uh, fairly late during residency, even though I loved obstetrics, that actually I, I really quite like gynecology too and I learned a lot from the gynecological cancer patients that I worked with. So um, I decided that I uh, was interested in medical genetics. I worked done an elective again that first year I was in Canada. And uh, so I did a fellowship in perinatal genetics and then had been promised a position back in Vancouver um, and uh, had nothing in writing. There was a change in heads um, while I was away doing my fellowship and uh, it was a little um, uncertain as to whether that promise was going to materialize. It did. Um, and then uh, I actually did not have very much mentoring in my early faculty career. Um, and we were building a new hospital, and uh, the junior person in the faculty was always the one that was sent out doing CME around the province. Um, so I was certainly very busy clinically, education-wise, and on more committees than you can shake a stick at, but um, not receiving much guidance uh, about um, the key things that were actually going to get me promoted as a full-time faculty member. Um, I uh, had a cross-appointment in medical genetics, uh, really enjoyed all of that, um, and was uh, given information that I could take three months off and uh, spend my time writing on leave uh, in order to qualify for promotion, uh, and that all the things that I had been asked to do uh, that appeared to be important and seemed to me to be important, weren't going to count for anything. Um, so at that time I was a little, uh, a little, um, feeling a little disenfranchised and so I decided that um, while I could have taken three months off and written that um, if the work I'd been done hadn't been valued then it wasn't clear to me it was going to be valued going forward. So I'd take a different path. So I, um, I ended up uh, um, doing some medical genetics, so continuing with medical genetic counseling and, uh, and did a little private practice for a while instead of the hospital-based uh, academic practice that I'd had. Um, so I, I learned about what private practice was like and uh, of course because I've been doing only high-risk obstetrics up until that point and um, uh, gynecology that, uh, that what was referred to me was all complicated. There were no easy consultations that were sent to me. It was always the pelvic pain, the uh, you know the, the the chronic things that are very challenging to deal with because of the things that I encountered. So anyway, um, I uh, I then ended up uh, spending my time. Uh, subsequently, I had three children somewhere along the way there, and um, <clears throat> and so spent some time. Uh, a long time doing genetic counseling and uh, and then prenatal diagnosis and ultrasound and ultimately gave up my uh, my clinical obstetrics. I'd stopped doing gynecology. Although for a while I had been providing um, both obstetric and gynecologic, gynecologic care to pediatric adolescent population, um, which was a strange thing for a maternal fetal medicine person to be doing, but it seemed to work. So. 
so that was th that part of the career and um, and then it's interesting how the justice part the, that thread continued because um, I uh, was headhunted um, for a, a leadership role at the hospital uh, at the same time that I was president of our Canadian society and uh, um, the youngest Canadian president at the time. Um, and that all came about because of my propensity to ask questions. I am a very curious person and if I don't really understand why something's happening and uh, my political savvy has only evolved over the years, you might say. So if I don't understand why something's happening, then I would just ask, so why is that decision being made and why not this decision and, you know, how are we, what's the, uh, the consistency around decision making and those kinds of things. So I, I'm quite sure that, that had a lot to do with why I became president of SOGC and it probably followed me from there. Let's go and talk a little bit because uh, you were president of FIGO. Yes, I was. And uh, tell me a little bit about what happened during that period of time. Which period of time specifically? Just while I was president of FIGO? Yes, I know you talked about Mahmoud appointing you to the yes. committee, and that was a yes. very critical committee. It we was. We all remember that report. It, was. it did create a few waves. It did. <laughs> it did, indeed. Um, well, uh, one of the things that was fascinated, uh, fascinating to me, um, well, first of all, I, I want to acknowledge the support that I received from ACOG, from yourself in particular, um, but from ACOG and from the leadership of ACOG, um, uh, from Mexico as well, and from AGO, and, and from Canada, in terms of me becoming president-elect. Um, uh, as you well know, I was actually acclaimed president-elect in Chile, and. Uh, and the response from the women at that Congress was overwhelming, it was fascinating. And everywhere I went after that. Um, um, so what was it like as being president of SOGC, uh, of FIGO? President of FIGO, um, so I, I had uh, been involved um, with advocacy around uh, maternal mortality, um, even leading up to being president. And I knew coming into the presidency that um, while FIGO had managed to move in terms of its sensitivities around abortion in particular and how to address that when it's a federation, that um, we really need to grapple with this in a, a different way. Um, because it was a huge cause of maternal mortality, unsafe abortion uh, globally. And uh, it's a longer story and I'm not sure we have time for it, but that came about my final decision that I was actually uh, going to be able to do that um, came about as a result of uh, a visit that I was asked to make to Guatemala to provide technical support when they adopted the, uh, what we call the FIGO rights-based code of ethics. And <clears throat> uh, met a colleague there who clearly was very opposed to the idea of women's sexual reproductive rights. Um, and uh, as I said, it's a longer story. I'll tell you over a glass of wine sometime. But, uh, but unbeknownst to him, um, he helped me crystallize that it was going to be possible in any country if it was country-led and collaborative with the Ministry of Health and possibly the Ministry of Education that we could come up with an approach that would work uh, in country that would reduce deaths and complications from unsafe abortion. And so uh, I uh, made the decision to um, move forward with that as a presidential priority and uh, receive support from an influential uh, donor, uh, anonymous donor, uh, to do that. And um, at the time, FIGO's response rate when it asked for interest in terms of projects or proposals was typically quite low. We'd have a very small percentage of responses when um, emails or faxes or letters were sent out. We had, from our 113 member associations at the time, 
we had uh, about 56 responses of interest with content in terms of what we asked for, which was tell us your draft action plan essentially within three months, which was a really short timeline. People were absolutely stunned. And of that, we ended up with 46 action plans that we moved forward with in conjunction with the Ministry of Health in that country. It was led by the member association in country. And yes, there were uh, um, expectations and deliverables as with any project, but it was a phenomenal response that was really quite clear to me that people in um, many of our member associations understood very well uh, the context of the lives of the women in their country. Um, and then the other two things were uh, moving forward with prevention, of cervical, prevention and management of cervical cancer. Again, looking at how we could potentially customize that in country to meet um, the resources that were available. And, um, and then uh, sexual violence, looking at how we could, again, uh, try and provide better support for women's, uh, um, women who had experienced sexual violence through uh, helping our colleagues um, be more able to deal with it. Do you think we will ever reach the goals of the Millennial Conference on Rights of Women? The Millennium Development Goals, well, this is 2015, and it's very clear that we haven't met Millennium Development Goal uh, number five, which is um, to reduce maternal mortality by 75%. No, we have not. Some countries will meet it, um, and that's very gratifying. Tragically, Nepal uh, was on track to meet it, and uh, with the earthquake that's just happened, I'm not sure how much that's going to impact them, although this is 2015, but it will obviously set them back again, which is really very sad. Um, and uh, one of the um, issues that uh, ACOG, FIGO, and others pushed for when the Millennium Development Goals were introduced was that access to contraception, to family planning, needed to be part of the uh, indicators, the targets, in order for us to actually achieve the Millennium Development Goals. And uh, it took us until 2007, halfway through, really, to actually get that added, universal access to reproductive health, of which um, contraceptive prevalence and so access to contraception uh, was recognized formally as something that needed to be part of our um, planning to reduce maternal mortality. It's, it's impossible to do it without access to contraception. We know that unmet need for family planning is huge around the world. Um, a couple of years ago, it was 222 million women married or in partnership who needed access to family planning and could not access it. They, that was their choice. They wanted it and couldn't access it. That's an unacceptable number. I agree with you. Well, Dorothy, I, I'd like to keep talking. You've got such a diverse background. <laughs> You've done so many wonderful things. From sitting on the outside, I know that your uh, tenure as the president of FIGO upset a lot of people but accomplished a lot of very wonderful things. And I think and hope that more people will continue along your route. Thank you very much. As I said, we could kiss here and talk for another half hour easily. But unfortunately, our time is up. So again, thank you for willing to be interviewed. Thank you very much, Rob.